Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We are knee deep in module two. This is artifact number two. And our discussion today will involve the art and architecture of the Byzantine world. And as I mentioned to you before, the Byzantine Empire is here, what is now modern day Turkey. Byzantium was the name of a city here along the Black Sea and the Bosphorus that when Constantine moved to it in 325, he renamed it after himself, which is sort of how he rolled. And the word Byzantine now uniquely means the art of the Eastern Empire. Now, it doesn't stay in the Eastern Empire. We will see Byzantine art and architecture in places like Venice and Ravenna and in 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 1500 years, we will still see Byzantine elements within painting in places like Rome and Siena. But for the time being, we can think about the Byzantine world being focused here in Constantinople. And then just like a rock being thrown into a lake and it ripples outward, the same is true that as we get further away from Constantinople, we still have Byzantine elements, but they maybe are a little bit different than what we're used to seeing here. So our, fo our, our conversation today is gonna largely involve a couple of buildings in Ravenna and then in, uh, and then in Constantinople itself um, when we look at Hagia Sophia. And if I play our cards correctly, we might actually look at um, some really cool things that are happening in Venice at about the same time. And so my friends, let's buckle up and get ready. And as a way to start, I call your attention here to Ravenna. Ravenna is on the Eastern coast uh, of, of Italy along the Adriatic Sea. Uh, and it's the kind of place that I had never been to until the summer of 2019. Um, and over a weekend, uh, the students had a free weekend. And so the lovely wife, the two little tykes and I, um, took the train up to Ravenna, rented a beautiful apartment through Airbnb, um, and managed to um, explore a pretty, pretty small town. So I want to give you kind of a, a map diagram of Ravenna just to talk about scale. Clearly, I'm not going to test you on this. This is where we stayed in like a kind of a like a, I don't know, a 15th century, like like five bedroom apartment, which is lovely. The walk from here to the end of this street was about a minute. The walk from up there to San Vitale there and Gala Placidia there was about seven minutes. It took a little bit longer because I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old, but if I was really uh, work, working at general Brian speed, that's about how long it would have taken. Over here is San Apollinari Nuovo and that from here to there is about also a seven minute walk. So Ravenna is very, is, 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 is tiny, very walkable, and is a city most known for its mosaics. And we've already looked at some mosaics, right? We looked at the mosaics here in Gala Placidia. And, and when we think about the dates of this Byzantine period, there's a couple of dates to keep in mind, at least particularly important for the early Byzantine period. 527 is the beginning of what we call the Byzantine period, and that is the beginning of the reign of Justinian. Justinian is a, a Roman ruler. Of course, he lives here in Constantinople, um, but he builds both a fantastic church there and then another one here, although he's never been there, as far as we know. So it begins with the reign of Justinian in 527, and then goes until the period of iconoclasm. Iconoclasm is a historical period where there begins to be a break in the artistic tradition and images of holy people, particularly Jesus and Mary, stop happening. And not only do we stop making them, but they start destroying them. All right. I want to talk about a church. This church was begun in 526, completed around 547. The church is called San Vitale. And what you're looking at here is a view, primarily this is the southern end of the church. 
And I mentioned to you that this pathway here, just beyond it, is Galaplachidia. And so there's a couple of parts of this church, and I'll show you a diagram in just a second. But this right here is something called a campanile. It literally is a bell tower. And so atop of that tower is a bell, and that bell rings when, the, when it's time for church. Bell towers are still constructed, and they still exist in this very day. So that is a bell tower. You can see that the church is kind of octagonal in shape. There are these little, these little nooks that come out on the back end here. But if we were to think about the shape of the church, it is in many ways octagonal, which makes it centrally planned in some ways. There is a central dome underneath that centrally planned structure. And there is there are two entrances into this church, two narthexes. Um, one narthex, that's the primary entrance, and another one that's just sort of there. Um, and I'll show you a detail of that in a second. Now, to be perfectly honest, when you enter this church now, you don't enter through either of those narthexes. You come in through the side over here. So when you enter the space, you, bu you buy a ticket. The ticket gets you into Galaplachidia and um, the church and San Paulo and Nuovo. And so you can kind of stumble around. This is another church um, just on the other side of it. Um, but when you get into this, you come this way, although originally you would have entered from this way. Here's another picture of the outside. And I show you this relatively blah, boring uh, picture for one reason, and that is to point out how uninteresting the exterior of the church is. The outside of Byzantine churches are not super well decorated. And the reason for that is that they were not needed to be decorated to bring the faithful into them. And I'll give you at least a kind of a good example of what will happen later. And let me just yeah, find a good Gothic church here. Oh, this will do. Here's the outside of Chartres Cathedral. And think about all of the sculpture on the exterior of this church. These images not only told stories, but provided maybe incentive to walk inside the church, right? There's Notre Dame in Paris. The exact opposite is sort of true during the Byzantine time frame. There isn't a need to make the outside decorated. So as a result, they're kind of not really that decorated. The insides, however, are going to be crazy decorated. And that will be something that will occupy our thoughts um, as we march along. So, so this is the, the, um, the, the, the outside of the church not super decorated. It's on the inside where everything is really, really fantastic. Again, when you enter the church now, I was really surprised by this. You come in through this side door. Originally, this was the way people would have entered. There's a door here and a door there. And I ask you to think about this for a second. Which of these doors do you think is the primary door? Door number one, or door number two. And if you think about it, I'll take a sip of my now increasingly getting colder coffee. And the answer will be clear once you understand what we're looking at. When you enter this door here, you look down the nave towards the apse. And again, the apse is the most important part of a church. That's the ideal view of this church. If you walk in this, if you look, walk in through this door, you walk certainly, th you look certainly through the piers here and you look through the dome space here, but you look off over there and that's not that interesting. And so the main view that you're supposed to get is sort of this way. Now this is looking towards the apse, towards that narthex here. But this is the way you were supposed to see that church. This is a view towards the apse. And we're going to spend some time looking at some of the mosaics in the apse of this structure. There's a mosaic here of, of Christ uh, sort of in judgment. And then there's a mosaic of Theodora, which is going to be on the viewer's right-hand side there. And there's going to be one of Justinian over here. And the fact that she's on the right and he's on the left uh, is really important. So let's begin 
by looking at this mosaic um, that is in the apse of this church. And again, the, these mosaics date from, if I were to guess about the, the image of Christ, probably around five, oh golly, 545, let's say. And we have five figures present. We have Christ in the middle, wearing his purple and gold, as I promised you, sitting on what looks to be a gigantic yoga ball. And he's flanked on both the left and the right side by two angels with wearing white garments, cool halos, and big purple wings. Next to those angels, and I'll show you details in a second, are two people. One, St. Vitalis, or San Vitale, here. And over here, the bishop. The bishop who built the church. And that will be important as we march along. Here's an image of Jesus, uh, and he has been shown in a youthful, beardless way with a gigantic halo, jewel-encrusted halo around his head, um, his purple imperial garment, the gold here. Let me say, like the gold you see here, you know what that's made out of? Gold. And this provides a really interesting visual effect when you see this object in person. And... And it's really hard to describe it, and I and you can't take video on there, although I would have loved to have done so. Because these things are naturally illuminated, you know, nighttime sky, and because your head moves around, and because this gold is not set perfectly flat into the wall, this gold background seems to shimmer and almost wink at you. And as a result, the image of Christ almost seems to pop out of the wall on at you. It's really quite staggering and, and surprising and lovely all at the same time. He has big eyes and we think of eyes as being important, right? Eyes are the window to the soul and you can see this, this work its way here for us today, this big, big eyes looking at us. And I wanted to bring your attention to a, um, a, a mosaic on another part of the church that dates from a little bit later, I would imagine. And this shows a very different image of Jesus. So even in the same church, we can have two different depictions of Christ um, in very different ways. And I find that really interesting. I mentioned to you on this at mosaic, we have Christ. And here you can see him handing over toward San Vitale, the, the church with for whom the, the, the saint for whom the church has been named, a kind of crown. San Vitale was martyred. That's a fancy Catholic word for he died for his faith. And as a result, he is going to get a nice crown in heaven. This is Christ passing that over towards him. And on the other side of the of all of that, you can see this image. An image of the bishop Ecclesius who built the church. And here you can see him actually holding a model of the church, which I think is kind of interesting. And we'll come back to that in just a little while. Now, I hope you will allow me a short digression because I, I want to have a little bit of fun because, well, and I have a different idea of what fun is for most of you perhaps. But I want to take a diversion and talk about a work of art from around 1305 that has nothing at all to do with this work of art, but allow us to get somewhere interesting. So the painting is by an, an Italian Renaissance painter by the name of Giotto. And this is from a place, a painting in a small chapel in, um, in Padua, and it's called the Arena Chapel. Again, arena is Latin for sand. This was a small chapel built by the Scrovengi family next to a small amphitheater uh, in Padua. The painting dirts, dates from 1305. Giotto painted the walls, he painted the ceiling, and this is the entranceway into the church. You can see a door here. And it is a depiction of the last judgment. The last judgment. Okay, so in a last judgment scene, what we usually have is Christ has come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And over here on this side of the composition, let me go back. That's what I want. When, I, if we, go, when we look at the left side of the composition, 
our left side of the composition, and we'll come back to this in a few modules of time, you can see we have good people, right? These are good people. They have halos, halos. On the right side of the composition, we have bad people. We have rivers of blood. We have Satan eating people and defecating people. It's good to be over here. It's bad to be over here. This is the left side of Jesus. This is the right side of Jesus, right? Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. The right hand is the good side. Left is the bad side. This has always been the case, and I'll give you a good example. Um, a couple of years ago, I went, I typed in the word sinister, and sinister, and, and it's a word, right? You know what sinister means, like sinister comes from the Latin word sinisteria. And you know what sinisteria means in Latin? Wait for it. It means left. The Latin word for right is dexter. So dexter and sinisteria. So I typed in the word sinister and this came up in Google. And it kind of looks scary, doesn't it? Sinister and sinisteria left and at least in English evil. And I don't know that you've ever seen the television show, Dexter. I, I really haven't, but I know what the show is. And if you don't know what the show is, I'll summarize it like this. Dexter is a, he works for like, I think like the Miami Police Department. And his area of specialization is like forensics. And what he does is he kills bad guys. Like people who have gotten away with murder, he hunts them down and kills them. Now, if you go to the Jewish Bible and you read the Ten Commandments, there is a commandment there, and it says, Thou shalt not kill. And the commandment is not, Thou shalt only kill bad people. It's pretty, pretty definitive. Thou shalt not kill. And yet, despite that, we kind of go along with Dexter. We realize he's killing bad people, and that's okay. And clearly, the author of the series of novels upon which the television show is based and the, 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 the TV makers want you to symbolize, uh, sympathize with Dexter, which is why he's been given the name for good in Latin. The word Latin, Dexter in Latin not only means good, but it also means dexterous, which means like nimble and, um, and pliable and good. So the good are on the right side of Christ. Again, our left side, his right side. The bad people are on the left side, the, our right side, but the left side of Christ. And so to give you an idea, we'll come back to this in a little while. This is a, a model. This is, this is Enrico Scrovengi. Um, his father, um, when Dante wrote the Divine Comedy, he put him in the eighth circle of hell with all the money lenders. And so the son, kind of worried about his dad, commissioned this, this uh, chapel and painted his father here, holding up a model of the church to the Virgin Mary and two angels. And is he on the good side of Christ? Yup, just barely. This idea good and bad, left and right, is, is a long artistic tradition, right? Here's Michelangelo's Last Judgment from the Sistine Chapel. Jesus, good people going up to heaven, bad people being drugged down to hell. So let's go back. Here is San Vitale, and there is Jesus. And on the right-hand side of Christ over here is Justinian. On the left side of Christ over here is Theodora. So let's talk about Justinian. Justinian is from Constantinople. Constantinople is far, far away from Ravenna. He never went to Ravenna, but here he is. And he's been shown in an interesting way. Here he's standing wearing his imperial purple, just like Jesus, in case you needed to be reminded. And he stands with a group of people. Over here are diplomats. Over here are soldiers. You can see they have shields and swords, spears. 
And look, there is that same shield I showed you with Constantine with the Chi Rho on it. Over here are the clergy, right? Here, someone's holding a censure. So this is a thing for swinging incense. This person has what appears to be a gospel or a book. This guy, whose name is listed, Maximanus, has a gilded cross. And Justinian is shown with them. This, this mosaic symbolizes both the, the Christian army, diplomatic, and the Christian priest corps. And if we think about it, interestingly, it looks like Justinian and Maximinus are kind of fighting for space. Look at his feet. His feet are closest to the ground line, and that means he's closest to us. But at the flip side of that, it looks like his arms are in front of him, as if the political state and the religious state are somehow in tension. And to be honest, they have been. Like Justinian is the royal ruler of the Roman Empire, but he's not the, the spiritual leader. Um, and this shows a bit of tension. It looks like he's wearing a halo, doesn't it? And I think that's really interesting. Let's flip it around. Let's look at the other side. Here's Theodora. And again, Theodora is on the left-hand side of Jesus. And she's shown, again, wearing a gigantic, uh, gigantic crown. There is what seems to be a halo around her. On the right-hand side of this, you can see her attendants. It looks like there's several of them. They all kind of look like her. Um, and then on the left-hand side of this, it looks as if they are pulling back a curtain. And there's like a water fountain there. We can interpret that to be a baptismal font. Of course, baptism uh, is one of, the, uh, one of the, the rites of the Christian faith. And so here we have Theodora, and she seems to be holding a kind of cup. He seems to be holding, well, it's sort of unclear. Maybe it's a plate. Maybe it's a loaf of bread. But either actually work for the sake of what we're talking about. He's holding either a plate that would hold the body of Christ or the body of Christ itself. And she's holding a chalice, something that will hold in turn the blood of Christ. And here they are together in the apse of this church. But there's only one small problem. By all accounts, Theodora was not the nicest of ladies. As a matter of fact, she was not of upper class stock. She was of remarkably base stock. She was lower class in every way imaginable. Her father was a circus worker. She was a, a circus performer. And if you believe the, the historian um, that wrote the secret histories, a man named Procopius, Theodora was at best a bad person and at worst a prostitute um, who pretty much would have slept with anyone who would have slept with her. The secret history, which is not the kind of thing I can read to high school students, uh, pretty much makes her out to be the most immoral person likely in, in Constantinople at the time. And here she is in the apse of a church holding a chalice that would have held the blood of Christ. It's a really interesting depiction. Justinian on the good side, Theodora on the bad side. And by all accounts, neither Theodora nor Justinian ever made it to Ravenna. And to be perfectly honest, they had enough cool stuff happening in Constantinople at the same at the during the same time to keep them busy here. And so what you're looking at is one of the great marvels of early Byzantine architecture. The building is called Hagia Sophia, and uh, it was built over the course of five years, 532 to 537. It was a Christian church. It became other things later. But again, most important function is the original one. And so we actually know the name of the two men responsible for the construction of this building. It's Anthesimus of Charles and Isidorus of Miletus. They're Greeks. They are not really architects. They're engineers and mathematicians. Um, and in many ways, that's what this structure is. It's a kind of 
architectural and mathematical problem. When you see it from up top, you can see one of the cool things about this building that becomes a little more hidden when you see it from lower on, and that is we have a round dome. Hooray, round domes. We've seen one before. We have a square base but we have not seen a round dome on a square base before. And that's one of the things that makes this building such an architectural wonder. You also see these things here. Those are minarets. They were added much later when this building became an Islamic mosque. And so this structure has been both a Christian church, a Judaic temple, an Islamic mosque, and now it's kind of really none of those things. Um, it's sort of like the Pantheon, I suppose. I mean, they do have Christian worships in the Pantheon, um, but it's so identified with its original function of a Greek as a building for all the Roman gods, Pantheon, that I've never heard anyone ever refer to it as Santa Maria del Rotundo. It's just the Pantheon. I want to show you some diagrams of this structure because we can see some really cool things that are going, that are happening on the inside. To begin with, we might want to think about the ways in which this structure is, well, it's a little bit basilica plan, a little bit centrally planned. Certainly, it is, its original shape was much more square than rectangle. And so most centrally planned spaces are squares, circles, octagons, right? That's a centrally planned church, right? The center kind of takes us there, even though they design an apse to take our eyes there. So this is both centrally planned, but it's so enormous. And I'll show you a picture of the inside in a second that it has all the benefits of a basilica planned church as well. This is our dome. This is our base. And the way we get to putting round domes on square bases is through this. These things right here. Those are called pendentives. And I'll show you what it looks like in just a little while. <laughs> now, arches uh, are really fabulous because arches allow us to push thrust downwards and outwards. And we saw this when we looked at Roman aqueducts. Romans develop some cool stuff, right? They develop concrete, but this is not made out of concrete. This is all made out of stone. And again, concrete can be poured, concrete can be, density can be altered, and this is stone. So in many ways, this is even more amazing than the Pantheon, because they were able to construct a dome on a square base using not concrete. And they did so through the use of pendentives. So this is a fish-eyed view of, a, of the interior of, the, of, of Hagia Sophia, of the dome of that structure. And I want to point out the, the dome, of course, here, where you can see it is covered with 42 windows that circle around it. And this line right here, and then you can sort of see it there. There's no line there because it's the, the back end of the church. But this is the base of that dome. And what happens is pendentives rise up. Oh, Lacey. We'll come back to Lacey in a second. These pendentives rise up from the base of the dome and they catch it right here. There's four pendentives. One, two, three, and another one up there we can't see. So to go back to this, where'd you go? Here it is. This are those pendentives. This is the base of our dome. These pendentives rise up and catch it and allow a round dome to be placed on a square base. This is one of the real miracles of Byzantine architecture, the putting of round domes on square bases. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit about Lacey Betcher because this is so cool. I took this young lady to Italy when I took a group of students from Clark University to, to, to Italy in the summer of two, or the, the winter break of 2008 and nine. She had never been outside of Iowa, Wisconsin, or Illinois, and Dubuque is on the border of those three places. And then we went to Italy, um, and two years later in graduate school, she went to 
Constantinople or Istanbul and got to go see there. I've still never been here, but Lacey Betcher has. And so, oh my goodness, I'm proud of this young lady. And and that was like a decade ago. So she's like a grown up now. She's got two kids. It's, it's awesome. Here's a better diagram of those, pen, those pendentives. They're architectural structures that rise up from the base that allow the dome to rest on top of it. So this is a really, really fascinating and cool structure. And it's fundamentally different than this structure, although they're related, aren't they? Like this is the, the, the Pantheon on the right, Hagia Sophia on the left, and they're related. They might not be brother and sister, right? But they're absolutely cousins. Um, and the things that unite them are fascinating, but the things that make them different make them even more interesting. And if we were to compare these objects side by side, here's some of the really interesting things we could say. One, Hagia Sophia is made entirely of stone, the but the Pantheon is made of concrete. And again, concrete can be poured, concrete can be modified in regard to its density. But, the, but Hagia Sophia is all stone. Secondly, we can think about the support of that dome. Hagia Sophia on the left is dome on pendentives. On the other hand, the Pantheon is a dome on a drum. And all things considered, a dome on a drum seems much easier now, doesn't it? Round dome, round base, everything is good. But dome on pendentives is quite literally the putting of a round peg in a square hole. There's extra stuff you gotta do to get there. And so it's a slightly more complicated structure. Let's think about light source. The Pantheon has two light sources. One is the door, the other is the oculus. Secondly, the, the Hagia Sophia has windows all around the base of that dome. And one of the things we'll talk about as we march along when we look at some church architecture, the more windows you put into the wall, the weaker that wall gets. I mean, Gothic churches will have a lot of windows. They put so many windows in there that the walls want to fall down. And so the thing that Gothic builders have to do is find a way to support that wall on the outside of the building so it doesn't collapse. And they do this through the use of something called flying buttresses. The same is true of this dome. Introducing all of those windows creates a weakness in that dome, the place where it needs the most support. And Thysimus of Charles and Isidore of Miletus are like, whatever, no problem, more windows, we got you. And so we'll, and we'll talk about that support in just a little while. And the second, and the, one of the final things that's really important about these structures is their function. The Pantheon was constructed as a dome was, pardon me, as a temple for all of the Roman gods. And Hagia Sophia was a Christian church. Now it's gone through changes, so too is the Pantheon, but it was constructed as a Christian church. As a matter of fact, let's talk about that name, Hagia Sophia. Now, I never had a daughter, um, but if I did, I would have loved to have named her Sophia. I love the name Sophia. Um, Sophia is Greek for wisdom. Wisdom. The word agia, H-A-G-I-A, -A, agia, is the Greek word for holy. And so here's, a, here's your SAT word of the day. A hagiography, remember graphy, writing, like, like lithography is using stone as a way of writing. Biography. A hagiography is a biography of a person that omits all of their flaws, right? So I'm trying to think, I'm looking at my bookshelf really quickly. Do I have a good hagiography here? Like, oh man. Yep, there we go. Here's a biography of, uh, of Theodore Roosevelt. I've read two of them, one by Edmund Morris and the other by Douglas Smith. Um, one is pretty fair and talks about all of the ways in which Theodore Roosevelt was a train wreck. And the other makes it seem like he should be Saint Theodore. 
story, right? So a hagiography is a biography that makes somebody out to be a saint. So this is the church of holy wisdom, holy wisdom. And so the way that they're able to support this dome is by providing cascading forces, an outlet to push weight downward. So let me show you this cross-sectional view here. So you have the Pantheon on the right and Hagia Sophia on the left. And you have to imagine how this structure sort of pushes downward force out like this and out like that. And Hagia Sophia does the same thing, but it goes down and down and down. We have a full dome and then half domes and quarter domes. And I'll show you an exterior view again, down and down and down. This is a remarkably complicated structure that finds really creative ways to push force down and outward to where it can be absorbed by these big things here, right? These big things are those buttresses. So it's sort of like a marble going whoop, doop, 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 all the way to the ground. So Agia Sophia is fantastic at, dis at distributing downward force, and that's really important. Pendentives, dome on a drum, light source, one window, 42. And as I mentioned to you, when you look at the Pantheon over the course of a day, it changes. And the same is true with this. Look at that. These buildings are alive. They sort of change over time. And I find that a really, really interesting and compelling thing about all of them. All right, let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about some major characteristics of middle and late Byzantine art. So if what we looked at so far was, was early Byzantine, this will be middle and late Byzantine. Um, and as a way to get there, um, I give you what I call the Professor Marie Spiro Memorial List. Dr. Spiro was a professor of mine in graduate school who I was her teaching fellow for, oh golly, at least twice, I think. And she was this fantastic old lady um, who smoked like four packs of cigarettes a day and had the, the raspiest of voices. And I loved her. And just like I do, I'm certain she had a variety of things that she said again and again. So this is her memorial list. One of the things she did was she would repeat the same thing three times. So she would say, gold, gold, gold. So we will see gold. You think you've seen gold so far? We haven't even begun to get there yet. She would also ask rhetorical questions. The angry Christ? Yes, it is. So we will see the angry Christ. You, whoever you are listening, Bob, Bob, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. It's all your fault. And Christ is going to glare at you. And then finally, she would say something and then just exclaim how wonderful it is. So domes, they're wonderful. And if you think about it, there was, we've had domes for a long time. I like domes. Pantheon had a dome. One dome was enough for the Pantheon. But when we get to the middle and late Byzantine period, there's not going to be enough domes, more domes. Give me more domes and give me angry Jesus, because that's the way we want to go. So let's start. We're going to return to Hagia Sophia. Here it is. Now, Hagia Sophia um, was a church that went through a variety of changes, especially after iconoclasm and especially after um, it became um, a... Uh, Islamic mosque. But I just wanted to show you an image of this gigantic Mary and this uh, gigantic toddler Jesus and show you a representation of Mary and, and her son um, from 867 and think about how different that is than something that happened maybe a couple centuries earlier in the early Byzantine period. I, th this is uh, from a church in Egypt, in uh, the monastery of St. Catherine. And we have this um, relatively flat, austere, non-three-dimensional view of Mary. This image of the, what we call the Theotokos, right? Theo, God, Tokos is Greek for mother, is, the, is, a, is a subject that shows up quite commonly during early 
well, actually throughout all, all the Byzantine world. I wanted to show you a church of the Theotokos. We have two churches here. These are from Athens, just outside Athens in a place called Hosios Lucas, Holy Saint Luke. Um, and these churches date from around 1000. And in a lot of ways, they look different than some of the churches we've seen before. There's a sense of decoration on the outside of these churches that is kind of uncommon. I often think that this, this colored stonework looks like, um, like gingerbread in some ways. Here's a diagram of these two churches. This is the church of St. Luke right here. And this is the church of the Theotokos. They are literally built onto one another and what I want to spend some time looking at is a third way to develop a dome, and that's called through a squinch. Building a dome on a squinch is like a nice compromise for between dome on a drum and a dome on a dome on pendentives. If a dome on a drum is a round dome on a round base and it sits nicely, and a dome on pendentives is a round dome on a square base where something is built up to catch it. A squinch essentially turns our square into an octagon by adding in these triangular bits here. And once you get that octagon, right, an eightagon, as I like to say, you can now rest your dome on it. So that's a great example of a dome on a squinch. And this is kind of what it looks like, right? You have to imagine our square base. Here it is on the floor. There it is up top. And then you put these triangular bits up there and then the dome rests there. And in those domes, we generally have a picture of an angry Jesus. And I'll show you a good one here. The word pantocrator is a Greek word which quite literally means um, judger or ruler. So here's this Jesus and he's looking down. This is from uh, the Church of the Dormition. This is a Dormition um, is a word uh, that comes from Greek, through, uh, French through Greek, which means sleep, right? In French, to sleep is dormir, D-O-R-M-I-R. -R. This is the Church of the D Dormition or the sleep. And I asked you to look at this Jesus, right? And this dates from around 1100. And think about how completely annoyed this Jesus looks like. He's angry, he's pissed off, and I'll be honest, I think he's looking at you. It's your fault. Like this is not a, um, a New Testament Jesus, right? This is an Old Testament angry Jesus. He's a judger. Um, and think about how different he is than that guy, right? That's like a nice, friendly, happy Jesus. Like I would like to go have dinner with that Jesus. This Jesus, on the other hand, is a little bit scary. Like, I don't want to make off the, make this, this Jesus angry. And I call your attention to all of the gold and the interior part of all of this. It's one of the, the domes, but a whole lot of gold. Again, dome, dome, and then dome. These churches are often filled with domes. And that will become certainly apparent when we get to, when we get to the late Byzantine as well. In that same church is, is, a, is a crucifixion mosaic. And in it, we have our crucified Christ right here. We have Mary and St. John. And we'll come back to these three figures because they commonly show up within crucifixion scenes. And I call your attention now to how different these objects look, right? This guy is short, squat, his proportions seem a bit off. And in contrast to this, he seems a little bit more elegant or elongated. Um, I don't mean to suggest to you that he is absolutely classicized, but he has a sense of pain that maybe wasn't present before. He's no longer shown as that beardless youth that we've seen. And he seems to have a sense of contraposto, just like we see with the Duriferous. And so there is weight shift. And it's not surprising. This church is in Greece. And it's not surprising that the Greek world would have statues like this around to, um, to empower a sense of contraposto. Let me give you one final church, a great late Byzantine church, uh, middle Byzantine, I beg your pardon, that shows us some really interesting things happening in Italy. 
So this is Church of St. Mark's. Um, St. Mark's, the, the, this church is bananas. Uh, it has more domes than it knows what to do with and more gold likewise. So St. Mark died in Egypt and his, his body was brought to Venice in 829 and they built a church in order to house those relics. But the church burnt to the ground and through one of the great miracles of, of fire and church relics, the, the, the relics were unharmed. And so they begun this church in 1063 in the middle Byzantine period. It was finished hundreds of years later in the late Byzantine period. And so in a lot of ways, and in a way that we will see with Gothic churches, it is a hodgepodge of architectural styles. Let's count them up. One, two, three, four, five domes. This was originally built as a Greek cross. A Greek cross is essentially an addition sign. And over time, they added this addition to it here which made it much more like a Latin cross. But originally it was a Greek cross with those four domes. And this, these statues on the outside here were all stolen from various places, either from Constantinople or from Rome itself. I showed you the, the four tetrarchs at one point, they are, um, were, were stolen from Constantinople. And here is an image of the interior of this church to give you an idea of the, oh my goodness, gold decoration. Much of this was brought back to Italy from the New World in the early part of the 16th century. And so the structure dates from the 11th century, but some of the decoration dates uh, from significantly later. This is a great introduction to Byzantine art. And as a way of reviewing all of that, Byzantine is a synonym for Eastern. When we come back, we will begin looking at other kinds of art, art that is done in the Western world, the Western European world, and we will call that medieval. But before we get to medieval art, we are going to spend some time looking at Islamic architecture. Islamic architecture is going to be strongly influenced by the art of both the Byzantine world and the classical world. Because architects borrow, architects steal, architects incorporate rather than invent. And we will see that without doubt in our next module, that which involves Islamic architecture.